We get tons of emails all the time. And like one of the big things is like in a hyper Bitcoinized world, what's the distribution of Bitcoin like? Yeah. And I think that'd be a, an interesting thing to get into. Yeah. Um, okay. So I, there's, there's a bunch of points around it. And like in the paper, I touch on credit, but I'll start, let's start with like, you know, base layer of Bitcoin. I'll caveat with this with, I don't know. Um, but what I expect is, you know, with all emerging economic systems, you know, whether it's a country, whether it's like a new industry or something, you always see this increasing amount of like, you know, inequality that exists in some form. And then ultimately that levels off. Um, and it's just like, it's um, this, you know, inverted U curve of uh, like the Gini coefficient, which is like a measure of wealth inequality. And, um, you know, so like when you, whenever you see that occurring, like, Bitcoin's going to have a high degree of wealth inequality. There's going to be a lot of people that get very rich off of this. And um, and that's the point of a lot of us coming here early is like a lot of people want to take advantage of that. They want to invest in that. They want to support something when it's, you know, a very low probability that it ultimately gets there. They understand the information more in depth. They get compensated for that in the long run because they took on a lot of risk and they literally put a ton of their wealth into this thing very early on for, you know, multiple decades. Like that'll be how that works and they're going to be compensated, sure. But it doesn't mean- Fair you know, play to them. Right, right, right. And like, that's the nature of any form of investing, right? It, it, and that's why like when people are like, Bitcoin is savings and all of that, I'm kind of like, well, mm. it, it's designed to be savings in the long run, but it's it's people invest in it as a risk investment, you know? And and it's going to be that for a significant amount of time. But, um, but anyways, like that tapers off because you can't eat Bitcoin and you can't live in it. So like eventually people are going to spend this and, um, and you know, that's going to cause that wealth inequality to go down. If Bitcoin was something that had actual like utility or something, that's something that would cause, you know, structural possession of it over time. If it had, or sorry, um, non-monetary utility. Um, which is funny because I think I made that mistake when we were on our last podcast yeah. too. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, so non-monetary utility. It can't really have non-monetary utility because... You can't do anything else with it. You can't and it exists in cyberspace. You could make arguments for like really nuanced things, right? And that would be more like, uh, you know, colored coins, like the original NFT concept or something that would be like, I don't know, you could kind of argue that that's still monetary or something, maybe like a subcategory. But it has financial it. utility. Right. Um, and, and more complicated yeah. and useful financial utility than gold. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, which you, I, I mean, I, I still kind of consider that to be like under the veil of like monetary utility. Of course, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, like the, um, uh, so yeah, there's, there, there's nothing you can't use it in electronics. You can't do anything else with it. So, like, because of that, which is a huge advantage of it, and a lot of issues that, like, you know, were criticisms of like free banking, for example, were due to the fact that gold had economic shocks associated with it. Um, and that was because of a lot of its non monetary functions. So, like, if we had some sort of major, you know, issue in the market of gold because, um, you know, whatever happened, like there's this huge demand or supply shock that's related to something for non-monetary, that complicates the monetary situation. So the fact that Bitcoin is pure within that dimension um, is, is really valuable to making it a reserve asset as well. But anyways, like getting back to the point of wealth inequality, um, it uh, so I expect that to be like an inverted U. We're probably going to see it follow a similar pattern to everything that's going to be over time. Some people are going to make an immense amount of money. Some people are going to hold out to the bitter end. Um, and, you know, and that's just how any economic system ultimately emerges. That's something that's pretty unavoidable. Um, you know, we'd like everybody to be rich and, but, you know, it's just not how it works. And with, then the question becomes like, okay, so what I write about in the writing is like, what about the Cantillian effect? Mm -hmm. And how would that work under like a full reserve system versus like a free banking system? And this is one of the key things. Oh yeah, let's pour another one. Um, this is one of the key things that I think people probably are overlooking on like the free banking side. Do you want a whiskey, Danny? I can have a beer. Okay. Yeah. Um, You'll drink a whiskey when you become a man. Yeah, one day. <laughs> so on the, on the uh, credit extension side, if you have a full reserve, then it's like, okay, we don't have to worry about the Cantillon effect. There's no centralized issuance of, you know, any form of credit money or whatever it is. And because of that, you know, the money is being distributed how it normally be distributed. No wealth inequality emerges due to monetary phenomenon. It would just be the way it is. That's a similar concept to like, if hypothetically we could use Bitcoin, 
you know, on chain or whatever, just Bitcoin lightning payments and no other, you know, credit system emerges or something. It's just lightning. And that's the only system that emerges. We'll have some sort of wealth inequality, but it's not going to be like the Cantillon effect from centralized issuance. And so yeah. people having an advantage over that. Um, now with free banking, this is where I, I'd say it's a little bit trickier of an argument, but I think it's uh, where it ultimately comes out to, and it's based on assumptions of the theory, right? So like if these assumptions aren't true, then this wouldn't be true, but assuming they are, then with free banking, if we have, just with any emergence of the system, you have an initial credit expansion. So you have a certain amount, you've got 21 million Bitcoin in the world, free banking system emerges on top of it, and then it ultimately finds a market. So it'll be like, we have credit that's expanding and it's increasing, and then eventually it'll be, here's the amount of reserves, the percentage of total money that exists um, in Bitcoin. So that 21 million will represent, say, 21% of the total um you know, amount of money that exists. Mm -hmm. And the rest is going to be like uh, fiduciary media, you yeah. know, credit money. And and once it kind of hits that market, and that's determined by a market, right? There's, there's all these competing forces that exist that'll be constantly like testing it. So when we have, um, you know, a, a good example of this was like when we had free banking systems emerge, you have all these banks come out. This, this segues back to our conversation from two hours ago. Vibe Brad Pitt. Yeah. So like when we have these systems emerge and we have all these banks and it's like, okay, well, you know, why, what prevents this credit from continuing to expand? Why don't they just keep pushing it? Why does it have to be 21% of reserves or whatever the market finds? Why doesn't it just keep going? And it's because there's natural limits to that credit expansion. So there's, um, in, you know, like the free banking theory, um, there's, uh, the concept is that basically like when we hit that natural level, there's all these different, uh, market forces that emerge. Like a big thing that emerges is to what we saw in like the old free banking systems, you have a broker class emerge. So like this was relevant more to the older systems because you'd have like one bank in a locale, everybody knows them. Right. And that, you know, the digital analog today is like, here's that first, you know, note issuer on lightning or whoever it would be that everybody's familiar with you know it has a brand it's like a tether to somebody or you know maybe a better brand usdc or whatever um so you have like back in these old locales they'd have these note issuers now if somebody had their notes from here they go travel to like a town over um and we go up to york for example then we try to present our bedford notes and all the guys in york are just like i've never seen this before i'm not going to accept that but you have a broker class. we will fight them yeah, we will we will fight we them. We will fight them. We will go to war with those. Well, well, what's the town over that you're competing with in soccer again? Well, they're also Bedford. They're called they're Bedford Town. Oh, Bedford Town. Yeah. Okay, so we go. So like you know, we're like yo. You, you talk to your buddy at the Bedford Bank, and you're like, don't take Bedford Town. Let's fuck those guys. And, and like that actually happened in a lot of these systems. So like, well, so when you had like broker classes that emerged, and they were like, okay, we're going to arbitrage the differences. So like, where people aren't accepting notes, or like they're accepting them but at a discount, we're going to buy them in this town at a discount, take them over to that town, and then go redeem them at the bank and get the full value. So you have arbitrage people that are like, you know, making the price be what it's worth. They're testing the redemptions, and they, and that forces these banks to maintain reserves because you have a broker class that's constantly testing their reserves. So that's one big thing. And then the banks eventually kind of like adopted that function themselves. So what it did is it encouraged wide acceptance of notes because if you were a bank and you started rejecting a lot of different banks' notes, that meant that you had you were rejecting all these notes that you could go redeem at other banks. So you go to other banks, get their reserves, bring your reserves up. And if you don't do that, then you have a bunch of people redeeming at you and your reserves go down. Mm -hmm. And so it the system incentivizes people to ultimately accept each other's notes. And because of that, we saw like wide acceptance of all these different note issues. Now, it wasn't without issues because like there was things like in the early days of like the Scottish um, free banking system, they had like note dueling that would break out. And this is something... Um, that I think could be probably another big issue that would prevent a free banking system emerging okay. within the Bitcoin world. But like note dueling was basically like you go to Bedford Town and you're just like fuck these guys and we're gonna we're gonna take these guys down and you go to their bank and you start like slowly like getting a huge account at Bedford Town and then one day you just go redeem all of it and like see if they got the reserves there and like a lot of guys would go do that and they'd say like we're gonna see if we can get like twenty percent of their note issue and go redeem them all at once one day. 
Um, so like that was going on in the early days of the banking system. Now what emerged was a system of like clearing houses. And once those emerged, they were a way rather than everybody just gross redeeming their notes between each other, they had a centralized way where they all net their debts between each other. Cause it's very operationally expensive to sit there and redeem between each other through a market like that. So they had a centralized clearing house, everybody would go there. They'd all compare their accounts and say, I owe you, you know, 50 Bitcoin, you owe me a hundred all, um, you just pay me 50 rather than do multiple transactions. Mm -hmm. So like, that's how these clearinghouses emerged. And once that happened, that kind of like brought a lot of the note dueling down. And that was interesting because like in the Scottish system, the um, reserve levels went from 10 to 20% range on average in like the, you know, first half of the 18th century to in the latter half of the century, the night or first half of the 19th century, um, they went down to about one to 3% after that. Once like clearinghouses were huh. up and running, there's also a lot of other things that affected it too. And I'm not a historian expert on all these episodes. I've read about them at a high level, but like there's arguments that like Bank of England was starting to influence them pretty heavily. And um, there was a 20 year period where they suspended withdrawals, which is like a major issue mm. that a lot of people um, are, you know, like Austrians have this criticism of that system. There was a war that was going on with France during that period. So like a lot of these systems like pretty much all do that. I mean, that happens in like all the banking systems all hop off the gold standard and everybody starts printing money, you know? So like shit ha starts happening, you know? But examples from centuries ago yep. uh, as kind of case studies for what yep. might happen now where we have technology yep. and systems to monitor and manage things. Like I, th yep. I think we can take examples, but I also think we have technology to help us like not run into some of the same issues. Right. And, and like, so like with that note dealing piece, um, one interesting point that I want to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do, I want to do more research into like how I think this could ultimately build out. But it was the, the key distinction between now and like back then is like, okay, so if we were to have, let's assume, let's make the assumption that we have notes emerge within a digital free banking system. These are, they're issuing fiduciary media. These are fractional. And if that occurs, then we're probably going to have like a broker class of like arbitrage people that are emerging and they're saying like, okay, you guys are making this promise. We're going to try to see if we can take you down. We'll take a short position. We'll accumulate a ton of your notes. And then we're going to go to try to redeem all of them. And we're going to see if we can push you into insolvency. So like number one, that would mean these banks are going to have to carry pretty high reserves to like, you know, protect themselves from that risk. Um, which is a good thing, right? It, it, it reduces the barriers um, of capital within this type of digital system. So it means that the reserve levels would have to be probably significantly higher. That's kind of like what happened to Tether recently, right? Exactly. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, it's effectively like what's like, um, you know, I, 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 you could call it like these note dealing things or you could really call it like a redemption attack, right? Mm -hmm. And like, that's kind of what happened when like Luna started to spiral out of control as well. Um, so like, we'll see a lot of that, which is a good thing. Cause number one, it'll make the market more efficient. The question is, is like, if it's so efficient and if we have things like flash loans emerging, where like you can effectively scale the liquidity of, you know, some sort of lender with a immediate flash loan, then that allows you to do these things in a much larger scale. If you can loan to make these things, you don't have to sit there and accumulate the notes, but you can actually like borrow a massive amount within an instant that'll kind of change the game. I haven't totally thought through all the details of that, but like with these types of technologies emerging, it could be that these things are so efficient that it might be kind of nearly impossible to run fractional to a very significant degree. And it's like, maybe maybe it hasn't happens and maybe it's 90%. Like, I don't even know. Maybe that's the reserve level. But there's... Um, there, 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 there's a lot of different things that could ultimately emerge that make it very hard for like a fractional reserve system to exist too. And like, that would be, I, I think that would be cool. Like there, there's trade-offs and there's costs. So like we've talked about earlier about like cost of production. Um, and um, I, but I think that like, if there's, if there's demand for a fractional system from other, other issues, like, you know, business cycles and the effect on investment, um, and the market is naturally allowed to ultimately, um, you know, make the decision of whether or not they want those things to emerge. I think that there's a lot of like benefits that could come from having fractional or potential benefits, theoretical benefits. Um, but it's uh, the more that I've gotten into the research around it, I think the less likely it is that it could actually privately emerge because 
you know, full reserve Bitcoin actually solves a ton of problems that fractional reserve systems didn't have to compete with before. Right. And like this goes back to that lightning piece I was talking about earlier with like interest rates. Now, if well, once that happens, and that's for sure happening. So like if you are a depository bank and you are going to run a big ass lightning node and you're going to have a ton of channels and you're going to attract a ton of liquidity and you're going to lease all that and earn a ton of routing fees, then you could have a probably, I think it's very likely you could have a fully sustainable business model of earning a pretty high amount of interest just from that without assuming counterparty risk. So not hmm. a, not even are like fractional reserve banks, but like full reserve banks are also probably going to have to compete with that as well. And it just makes like this... Um, this full reserve, no counterparty risk model, a new vector of competition with a banking system where it's just like, you're just a really good node operator and you're just like moving capital around. The The right way to think about this is now that we have this peer-to-peer -peer payment network, we're like normally that value is being captured by like credit card companies and applications and things like that in our current system. Now that it's peer-to-peer -peer and that value can be captured by individuals peer to peer. It's fucking awesome. It's fucking sick. Yeah, yeah. I completely agree. It's gonna be yeah. it's badass. So like now we can capture that. That five percent fee going to your credit card company, that's going to you, baby. Like you want to provide liquidity to the Lightning Network, you can do that. 